Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We see, especially in the New Covenant, in the teachings of our Messiah, Yeshua himself, that he emphasized the Sabbath day. His ministry utilized the Sabbath day. Many of his miracles of healing, many of his instructions, his words of revelation, they were given on the Sabbath day. And we see and remember that time in the city of Nazareth or Nazareth, that it was on the Sabbath day. And according to his minhag, his tradition, what was customary for him, that on the Shabbat that he would be the one who would read from the Haftorah, that is, the prophetic reading. And we know that how he read from the prophet of Isaiah, and in that he revealed who he was and what his purpose is. And all of that took place on the day of revelation on the Sabbath day. And if you were to ask me, is the Sabbath day still relevant the answer would be a strong and resounding yes it is. But so many people are confused about Shabbat. Now we're going to take the first few uh, initial moments and we want to set forth some principles, deal with some issues so that when we turn to the scripture, we can be better prepared, we can have the mi right mindset in order to understand and appreciate what is said in this passage. Now, many times I am asked the question, do I keep the Sabbath day? Do I observe the Sabbath? And that's an easy question to answer, but it's usually misunderstood. See, a simpler question would be, do I believe the Sabbath has relevance? And do I acknowledge the Sabbath? And do I believe that the Sabbath still has purpose today for believers? And the answer is yes. But we need to do so in a way that is biblically sound. And here's the problem. I remember speaking at one location and some individuals, nice people, sincere people, people who truly love the Messiah, followers of the God of Israel. They asked me the question, do you keep the Shabbat? And I turned the question back and I asked, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, do you acknowledge that the Sabbath day is the day of worship? I said, oh, no, I, I certainly would never say that. Because such a statement is unbiblical. See, what is the day of worship? Well, it's the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, and of course, Shabbat. We see that Daniel, he turned to worship God, to pray to him three times a day, every day. And if you go to a synagogue, you will find that they just don't have services for worship one day a week, but every day of the week, three times a day. Here again, every day. So biblically, we do not see there is no scripture that shows that in a, a different way than other days, that the Sabbath is the day of worship. Every day is a day of of worship. No, when we see biblically about the Sabbath, what we find is that it's a day of menucha, a day of 
rests. That we are called in a unique way, not just to worship, but to sanctify the Sabbath day because God sanctified the Sabbath day. And although we're going to read in the study today of the text that we're going to be looking at from Exodus 31, that it's a sign between me and the children of Israel, realize the origins of Shabbat has nothing to do with Israel. The origin of Shabbat had to do that in six days, the Lord created the heavens and the earth, six literal days. And on the seventh day, on Shabbat, he rested. And what we see is that he sanctified. It is wrong. Let me just deal with a tangent for a moment. It is wrong to see the number seven as completion. It's not. The number 10 is completion. The number 7, as in the seventh day, God sanctified. The word sanctification, and we've taught this recently, has to do with acknowledging holiness, acknowledging purpose. What is unique about the Sabbath day, it is a day that we do not do melacha, that is work, laborious work. It is set apart for the purpose of God. It is set apart for a day of rest. And we'll talk more about some key passages that deal with this in a moment. But I want to give you a couple of verses for an introduction. Look, if you would, to a very important group of uh, verses from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 28 and 29. Numbers chapter 28 and 29 deals with offerings, sacrifices that took place at the tabernacle and then when the temple was established in Jerusalem, this was the only place that the altar could be set up and sacrifices, offerings made. So when we look here in excuse me, Numbers chapter 28, we're going to see something. If you look at verses 9 and following the next few verses, you're going to see that there were specific offerings made on the Sabbath day. And if these offerings were not made, then the Sabbath was not kept. And because there's no altar today, no temple today, there is no way that one can literally, from a Torah standpoint, keep the Sabbath. Because some of the things that had to be done could not be done. We know as well. Let me give you another scripture. The book of James, chapter 2 and verse 10. Verse that we all know probably can recite it by heart, all of us. And that is, if one keeps all the law, every commandment. But he stumbles, he errs, he falls in one commandment. So traditionally, there's 613 commandments. Now, some of the commandments are for priests, some are for men, some are, are women, some are for different groups at different times. For example, some can only be observed in the land of Israel. But let's just say that someone kept, theoretically, 612 of the 613. But that 613th one, that one, he stumbled in. He erred. He did not complete it properly. He did not keep it. What does James tell us? That he's guilty of all the law. What is the message here? The message is that we should see the Torah not as 613 individual commandments, that if I do most of them, pat me on the back, but the Torah is one. There is one Torah, and it has to be affirmed and completed properly. If you err at one point, it ruins everything. Now, does that mean, oh, I sin so I can go out and do more sin? Obviously not. Paul answers that question. That would be a foolish, rebellious, and, and a wicked thought. 
but the Torah is a unit. And today, because there's no temple, well over 250 commandments cannot be performed. And this tells Orthodox Judaism, and it should tell you as well, that the Torah is not in force. That's not by accident, but rather it is by heavenly design. Because now we're called to walk by faith. We are sons of Abraham. Now, a week ago, I taught from the book of Romans and chapter 4. The first 14 verses of Romans 4 at our study center that I do immediately before this live stream. And there it talked about Avraham and how Avraham, he was seen as righteous because God credited to him as righteous by means of faith, not in works. Not because of the keeping of the commandments was he called righteous, but because of faith. Now, this is important because when you walk by faith, Paul tells us, being led by the Spirit, you fulfill the righteousness of the law. So today, in the age that we're living in, we're not able to do the Torah completely because there's no temple. But now we take in, here's the halakhic principle. Here's the thing that we should apply to our life. We should study all the commandments and being led by the Holy Spirit, take the relevance that the Word of God and the Spirit of God reveals to us and apply that relevance and the truth and the purpose of the law to our life. And we who walk in the Spirit, we walk by faith in the Spirit, and we can fulfill the righteous purposes of the law. Now, what does that mean from a practical standpoint? Well, it means that we can still see relevance and purpose in the Shabbat. But if we do not keep the Shabbat, and we can't, it does not mean that God's judgment will fall upon us. You know, there's a very important statement in the New Covenant when it says we are not under the law. Most people don't understand what that means. That's why our emphasis is to teach the Bible from a biblical context. Many times we say a Jewish context, but what we really mean is the context, the understanding that God gave first and foremost to the Jewish people. They understood this. And when it speaks here about the Word of God and Shabbat and what it means being under the law, that phrase, under the law, means not under the judgment of the law. Paul teaches, for example, in Galatians, that Messiah went to that cross in order that he might take the judgment of the law, the curse of the law. But what remains? Well, we know that the law is both blessings and curses, life and death. He died so I could have eternal life. He took the curse. So when I properly being led by the Spirit, walking in faith, apply the truth of the Torah to my life, not in a ritualistic, not even in the way that the Torah demands because there's so much of it we can't do. I can't offer up a sacrifice. We can debate the, the edificy of offering a sacrifice. I personally believe if the sacrifice has anything to do with sin that's going to pay a penalty for sin, there is no more sacrifices for that. Because Messiah, he completed perfectly what was needed to pay the price for all sin. Now, you can look at other studies about those sacrifices in the millennial kingdom and find out that there's no conflict with what's going to be doing, going to be taking place then and what I've said now. Yeshua's blood pays the penalty for all sin. 
There is no longer any other offering for sin that is effective in removing God's judgment, only what he did upon the cross. So what we find is that Messiah's death took the curse. He died so that we can have eternal life and live a life that is blessed. By how? A blessed life is when we take the truth of the Torah and we apply it to our life. Let me give you an example that perhaps might make this a little more clearer. Let's talk about Passover. Now, Passover, according to the Torah, it requires you to go to Jerusalem, be there on the 14th day of Nisan, offer up upon the altar a lamb or a goat for the Passover sacrifice, Korban HaPesach, and to roast it and do all those things. You can read about that in Exodus 12. Now, we all agree, you cannot do that today. Now, you might say, well, there's a group of people that they do kill a lamb. Well, they may kill a lamb, but they're not offering a lamb. Why? No altar. No priesthood that is functioning. It cannot be done according to the Torah instructions. So all of that is of man. But what can I do? Well, it's traditionally, there's based upon a scripture that we are to do the service of Passover. And that's traditionally thought of as the Seder. Now, the Seder was just that. People would go to Jerusalem. When the temple stood, they offered a sacrifice. They ate that sacrifice with their family so that when their children would ask them, why are we doing this? They could tell the story of Passover. Obviously, we can't do that today, but here's what we can do. At our homes, we can gather and we can go through and teach using the elements in the Bible. Some add based upon rabbinical instruction, but we can take bitter herbs. We can take matzah and we can remember through the Lord's Supper, the body and the blood of Messiah, he being our Passover lamb. And we can study about Passover and teach that and mark that day, sanctify that day, observe it in a special way. I believe that is highly effective. I believe by doing that, it conveys biblical truth. It is great for understanding more and more about the work, the ministry of Yeshua. And it brings a greater understanding of New Testament passages that deal with Passover. So is it good for us to say when Passover comes, we're going to mark that day? Yes, it's good that we might gather and we might share and retell the story of the Exodus and also study what Yeshua did on his final Passover. That Eve, when he met with his disciples, when they had that special meal, and then when he was arrested, when he was betrayed, when he was, was sentenced to death, when he was given over to the Romans, and all these things that go around. Is it great to study that on any time of day, but certainly on that 14th day of Nisan, leading up to it at that period? It's good, it's beneficial to do that. And in that same way, it's good to, on Shabbat, to mark that. Is it for the purpose of saying, I'm better than you that don't and I do? Obviously not. That is a stench. It is pride. It is a stench in the nostril of God. It is not meant to distinguish people, fellow believers, but rather it's for personal enhancement. That I might grow, that I might mark that day, and we'll see some of the benefits of that so that I can grow closer to God and, and understand the meaning of this day and take the relevance. But doing that does not make me say I keep the Sabbath. I acknowledge the Sabbath. I believe that there's reverence for the Sabbath, relevance for the Sabbath today. But one cannot keep the Sabbath according to the Torah. And we ought not keep it simply how the rabbis say because 
There's many implications to doing that, and that's not the purpose of this message. But I want to go back and talk about how people can get confused and how they can become legalistic and use what could be good in order to, to elevate themselves and putting others down. I can remember I was at a conference and a very nice, sincere person asked me a question. And they said, we have a debate. And it has to do with the Passover. He says, we have a Seder at our house every year. And, and I will not allow any man to be there because if he's uncircumcised. Is that the right position? Isn't that what the Torah says? And my answer was this. You're wrong. Because what you're doing in having a Seder at your home is not a Torah observant avodah that it mentions in the book of Exodus. You're simply reminding it. Let me ask you a question. You have people come over to your house to keep the Passover with you in your terminology. Is that true? He said, yes. I said, when you finish, what time do you normally finish? He said, oh, around, around midnight, 1230. I said, then what do the people do? Well, he says, they, they go home. I said, but what about the passage of Scripture that says, do not depart from that house? And what about the passage of Scripture says that you eat it, not just with your friends or whoever you want to invite, but that you only eat it with your family or if the next family is too small and yours is as well, you come together with the neighbor closest to you. That's also said. See, the problem is that people pick and they choose, and they point fingers in order to elevate themselves. All of this today, can we teach about why is it that God's word says don't depart? But can a person walk home, for example, cross the street or whatever after enjoying a Seder with a neighbor? Of course. Why? Because we're not keeping a Torah observance Passover Seder. It's impossible today. Therefore, utilize that, inviting people, sharing biblical truth. So it's when we confuse ourselves to believe that today, without a temple and other things, that we are keeping the Torah when it is impossible. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to take every biblical commandment, study it, understand what the Word of God says, and then apply under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, based upon new covenant faith, how to take that Torah commandment and apply it and utilize it and understand the relevance for it and proclaim it to others. That's what's pleasing to God. But if someone doesn't do that, they're not under God's judgment. No, the Torah can be utilized in order to bring growth. And that's what we're going to talk about as we now move to our study of Shabbat from the book of Exodus, chapter 31. Chapter 31, we're going to begin with verse 12. Notice what it says. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You speak to the children of Israel. Now, at this time, who were the children of Israel? Those from the 12 tribes and still that mixed multitude. Gentiles that came and joined because they had a Passover experience with the Lamb. And who is B'nai Israel today? Well, now don't confuse the term Israel with being Jewish. What we find is one is Jewish because they are descended physically from the lineage of Jacob. They are a son or daughter of Yaakov. But, but those who are faith, those who believe in Messiah, in the God of Israel, who have received the gospel, they become part of the household, the commonwealth of Israel, which is made up of people from every tribe, every nation, every language, every people. But that does not make them Jewish. There is nothing wrong with the the ethnic attachment that God's given to people. And it's that, that difference 
these unity from people from different nations, languages, ethnic backgrounds, race backgrounds. All of that coming together under the Lordship of Messiah is beautiful. And it shows the faithfulness of Israel. The more Gentiles that come in, that is pleasing to God. And that is what Israel was supposed to do. So look again at verse 13. And you speak to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbaths. Notice it's in the plural. Now, I asked someone, what does that mean, Sabbaths, in the plural? He says, well, this week and next week and the week after that, and does not. It means the seventh-day Sabbath, that's what we're primarily talking about. But there's also Shabbat as a high Sabbath, a festival day. There's also Shemitah, which is a Sabbath year. And there's also the year of Jubilee. So the term, my Shabbat has to do not just with the seventh-day Sabbath, but other types of Sabbaths that the Word of God speaks of. Once more, surely my Sabbaths, and they belong to Him, my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a oat. And I would circle that word, because the word oat speaks about a sign, a miraculous sign, but here's the key. More often than not, when we look at it in the scripture, it refers to something that only God is able to do. And it speaks about when we honor the Sabbath. And I like that better. If someone says, do you honor the Sabbath day? Do you mark the Sabbath day? Do you acknowledge the Sabbath day? Yes. But can we keep it according to what the Torah tells us? But does that mean it loses relevance and we should ignore it? We ought not. So he says here, and we need to realize that all of this is God's reference or revelation. And therefore, it's not some for today and not relevant for tomorrow. No, God, Messiah Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and between you, how often? Throughout your generations. And when one takes seriously the Shabbat, what is the outcome? Well, remember, when we look at this verse, going back to to verse 13, a little earlier on, it says, Ki ot he, because it is a sign, a miraculous sign. God does something. And what does he do? We'll look at the end of verse 13. Between me and you, throughout your generations, here's a miraculous sign. To know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Here's the biblical truth. Mark this down. When one acknowledges the Sabbath, that we remember that God has sanctified it, that he has set it apart, that he's given that day purpose. When we do so, God goes to work miraculously and that he, we become knowledgeable of this God who sanctifies us. What does that mean? He goes to work. Sanctification is a process. The the word itself denotes a process by which holiness is manifested. And holiness is related, and I say this so much you should know, it's related to the purposes of God. So when I acknowledge, when I proclaim relevance for Shabbat, when I mark that in my life, when I understand God has sanctified that day, when I acknowledge that, when I understand the relevance When I embrace that, then God is going to go to work miraculously in my life to teach me, to show me, to make me know. And this is, there's two Hebrew words for know. One is la'akir, that's kind of a head knowledge. And la'dat, that is an experiential knowledge. That we might know that God sanctifies us, that he is a sanctifying God. Verse 14, and you shall keep the Shabbat, 
and sanctify it. He says, you shall keep the Sabbath, for holy it is unto you. Now, the second time I translated it better. Ki kadosh kodesh, slakha, kodesh ki lechem. For it is holy for you. So it has a holy aspect for us. This is what he's talking about. This word holy is the same word for sanctifying. And therefore it says, one who profanes it, one who profanes it surely dies. Now that tells us how important the Sabbath is. Now, does that mean that if one transgresses the Sabbath? Now realize, is the Sabbath enforced today without a temple? It is not. But it's still relevant. And we need to realize that when we do not take seriously the Sabbath day, there will be a consequence. Now, this can relate to two things. Number one, a judgment from God. In the same way, it speaks about on the day that you ate that fruit. This is what God's telling Adam and Eve. You will die. Did they die immediately? Yes and no. Not physically, but spiritually. That process of physical death also began in their life. So in that same way, when we ignore the Shabbat, it is not a good outcome. And this is referring to a biblical commandment that in the children of Israel, when there was the tabernacle and when there was the temple, if one did not keep the Sabbath, if they willfully transgress it, they would certainly be put to death. For our purposes, it shows importance. For all who do in it, everyone who does in it, and notice the word here, ha ose. It is a Hebrew participle. It means a, a phrase that describes someone, that he is described as one who does, and does what? Does on it, and here's this word I mentioned earlier, me'lacha, who does laborious work. This one, his soul shall be cut off from the midst of, of its people, meaning the soul is feminine, so so relates to that person from his people, but it's in a spiritual language here when it says her people referring to the soul because the soul is feminine. Now we go back to see the origin of the Sabbath, and that is creation. Why do I say that? Look at verse 15. Six days, it says, he shall do labor, but on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath of sabbaton, meaning a, a holy Sabbath unto the Lord. And everyone, doesn't matter who it is, everyone who is described, that same participle, how will say, everyone who is described as doing work on the Sabbath day, here's the second time, mot yumat, will utterly, surely, it's a word of intensity, this phrase, the word to put to death is twice appearing. It's a grammatical construction. He will utterly be put to death. Verse 16. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath and do the Sabbath. So we have keeping and doing. That's why, according to tradition, we have uh, two candles that women light on the Sabbath day. If a woman's not there, a man can certainly do it. And there's a debate whether it's for this where it says here that he should do the Sabbath and to keep it lishmor ve la sot or la sot ve liskor and to remember. So do it, keep it, remember it. This is what it's being instructed. So the children of Israel shall keep my Sabbath to do my Sabbath. Notice once again the second time throughout their generations as a Brit Olam as a eternal covenant but the word eternal olam can mean kingdom it's a kingdom covenant it teaches us the sabbath teaches us about a kingdom character i want to say that again the sabbath teaches us about a kingdom character and let me give you 
a biblical example. In fact, turn if you would. Hold your place in Exodus 31, but look with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58, a great passage of scripture. When we sanctify the Sabbath day with Kiddush, this prayer over the, the cup of the fruit of the vine, we, we say this on the Sabbath day uh, after the morning service on Shabbat. But look with me to Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to read just a few verses, two verses. Read it in Hebrew first. now let's translate this. And if you restrain your foot on the Sabbath from doing your will, and that's an important thing. We don't operate the Sabbath day in acknowledging it, seeing its relevance, applying Sabbath truth to our life. It says, don't do your desire. When it says foot, don't go where you want to go to. It's not your day. It says, it is my holy day. And you are to proclaim, here's a commandment, to proclaim the Sabbath day to be an oneg, a delight. And you're supposed to sanctify the Lord. Acknowledge Him. Set this day apart. That's how you acknowledge Him. And that you recognize His holiness. How do you recognize His holiness? From doing Keep reading, doing your way. And from finding and pursuing your desire and from speaking your word. So here's a very applicable passage. On Shabbat, don't go where you want to go. Don't say the things you want to say. Don't seek the things that you're looking for. But rather, demonstrate submissiveness. And the outcome of this submissiveness it is going to cause you to have joy, a delight. And you're going to learn each week as I set apart the Sabbath day, acknowledging its relevance. God is going to go to work. He is going to have a sanctifying influence in me. And that day, I'm not going to watch what I want on television, read what I want to read. See, What's problematic today is this. Under Orthodox law, if you want to read a book on Sabbath, that's permissible. For me, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, no, it depends on what book you're reading. Is it a book that keeps the Shabbat uh, character? Does it have a, a spiritual purpose to it? If it doesn't, that may not be immoral. It might be a, a nice mystery story or a biography of someone but that's not fitting for Shabbat if it's not someone from the Bible or someone who is submissive to the truth of God. Look at verse 14. It says, if you do these things, then you will delight concerning the Lord. And God says, I will set you. I will set you upon the high places, Bomate on the high places of the earth, and I will feed you the inheritance of Yaakov. Great Yaakov. Doesn't mean deceiver. It's one who pursues the things of God. Yaakov, your father. And notice all of this for from the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what a wonderful passage of Scripture for encouraging us to say there's relevance, and as a believer, being led by faith, having the Holy Spirit, I want to take the truth of the Shabbat and apply it to my life that the joy, that the delight, and the benefits of the Shabbat, the spiritual benefits that can have physical outcomes are, are realized in my life.
Shabbat is wonderful. Not from a legalistic, but from a spiritual perspective. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 31 where we left off. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 16 at the end where it says once more, Brit Olam. Brit Olam, a kingdom covenant. One that has kingdom relevance, as I mentioned. Verse 17. Between me and between the children of Israel, the family of God, the commonwealth of Israel. It says, B'nai, because it's the heirs of Israel. Those who are going to inherit the kingdom promises. It's between me and between the children of Israel, once again, Ot, that miraculous son. That God does. He's going to go to work. See, God keeps the Sabbath. But what did he do? He stopped creating so that he could spend it with us. And he mediates. He sanctifies that Sabbath day that's ongoing. And he works to sanctify us. Shabbat is the primary day, biblically speaking, that we see God at work spiritually to bring us to the position the condition that God wants us to be in. You say, well, is that taught in the New Covenant? Absolutely. And that's why so many of Messiah's miracles of healing, of restoration, all had to do with taking place on the Sabbath day. Just do a study of the Gospels. See how many healing miracles took place specifically on the Sabbath day. Verse 17. It is between me and between the children of Israel for a sign, Leola. Most Bibles say forever, that's fine. It could be for this world, that's fine. But it has kingdom significance, Olam, kingdom significance. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. But on the seventh day, he rested. I love this. Vayinafesh. It is a spiritual word. It has to do, most would say, being refreshed. But it has to do with him working in the soul of a person. Bringing about a spiritual outcome because of Shabbat. Let's do one more verse and we'll conclude. Verse 18. Last verse of chapter 31. And he gave to Moses... As he had finished speaking with him. So it's God. God gave to Moses when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai. Two tablets of testimony. Stone tablets written with the finger of God. Now this is important because the finger of God shows a personal touch. And do not miss the context here. It is so significant, and we see something from this. The sages of old understand something. And that is, as I acknowledge Shabbat, as I proclaim Shabbat, it's a delight. When I do that, it has an outcome. God goes to work. He works to bring sanctification into my life. And the outcome is going to relate it to what? Well, what's on these tablets? The commands of God. So it is going to sanctify me for the work of God. Understand the relationship between the commandments of God and the work of God. It's through the commandments of God that teaches me what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to serve God, how I behave to, to show the God, character of God in my life life now what is truly wonderful about the sabbath day is this we see it and i'm going to close with this statement because i want to go less than an hour tonight we see the shabbat if we understand it properly we remember that the shabbat is not a reward for working six days don't see that in the scripture says you work six days and on the seventh day. But who did that initially? God. The first time humanity, and I'm speaking about Adam, Bechava, Adam and Eve. The first thing they did after being created was that God created them 
so that they could spend Shabbat. They were the last thing created. There is a pitgan, that is a, a kind of a, a saying in Hebrew. The last thing created, the last things done, was the first thing in someone's mind. Everything else was preparation for that. And that's so true about creation. The last thing that was created was humanity, but this was primarily what creation was about. And what did God do? He got everything in order, and then he kept the Shabbat with humanity, with these two individuals, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. We see marriage related to Shabbat. But Shabbat is not, are not a reward for good job, those six days of work. But Shabbat was preparation for them in order to go to work after the Sabbath. And that's what I'll close with, Shabbat acknowledging it, understanding its relevance, proclaiming it, allowing it to be a joy in your life, doing the Shabbat, not in a ritualistic, we can't do it according to the Torah, but we can take Torah truth and apply that principles to our life, that God has a sanctifying influence in the life of the believer so that we can be fully prepared, restored, in order to serve him and to demonstrate his sanctifying influence in my life. That is a primary truth concerning the Sabbath day. Well, I'll close with that until next week, and we enter into another exciting chapter in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.